Hello everybody and welcome to the first of the Landscape Builder tutorial videos for the new group system. For version 2 of Landscape Builder, we're introducing a new placement system as a replacement for the old mesh population system. It's faster, more powerful and more versatile than ever before. In this video, I'll be showing you the basics of this system, known as the group system, and explain the core concepts and main features. The remaining features will be explained in later videos. Just a note before we start, I'm using a pre-release version of Landscape Builder, so you might see some changes in later versions. For these changes, you can consult the manual or post us a message on our Unity forum. Core to the group system is the concepts of groups and members. So in this landscape here, I have two groups, as you can see here. I can add and remove groups via these buttons at the top. Each group is a collection of different objects known as members. So if I expand this rocks group here, I can see the group settings at the top here, as well as the different members at the bottom. I can expand the settings for each member as well with the hide and show buttons. Each member contains a single object, which will be populated throughout the landscape. In this case here, the object is this rock prefab. Different groups and members can be turned on and off with the checkboxes here, and the groups can be renamed at the top up here for convenience. There are three different types of groups, procedural clearing, manual clearing, and uniform, which can be chosen up here. I'll begin by explaining the uniform type as it has the most in common with the previous mesh placement system. I've already got this rocks group you can see here set up as the uniform type. Uniform is used to place objects evenly throughout your landscape according to a set of rules you defined, either per group or per member. Let's start with the group settings. No general options apply to uniform groups, so we'll move straight on to the default settings, which you can see here. All these settings can be chosen at the top using this tab bar. The default settings allow you to choose what the default placement rules are for this group. You can override these options for each member individually, but generally you should create groups containing only objects that have something in common with each other like these rocks down here, so often having defaults applying to all members is a good starting point. Minimum and maximum scale here define the limits for how small or big an object can be. For each object, a random number between these limits can be chosen, and the object scale will be set accordingly. This number corresponds with the scale parameter of the prefab's transform. Minimum and maximum height control the minimum and maximum terrain heights in meters that the object is allowed to be placed at. Minimum and maximum inclination here do the same for slope and are measured in degrees. So in this landscape, this says, these settings say that each of the rocks has a, will be set a scale of one as the minimum and maximum scale is the same, will appear between zero and 100 meters in height, and will also appear between zero and 30 degrees in inclination. These settings work in exactly the same way as they do in the texturing, trees and grass tabs. The other tabs to the group level settings aren't as important to grasp the basics, so it will be covered in separate videos. Let's move on to the member level settings now. If I click the show button here next to member one, you can see that settings specific to that member are exposed here in this box, you can see the rock prefab that I've chosen for this member. Then there are a number of settings controlling general placement rules for this member. Max prefab per square kilometer here specifies the maximum number of prefabs that can be placed within a region the size of a square kilometer. This is used for controlling how many prefabs get placed in the landscape. Increasing this value increases the number of prefabs that will be placed and vice versa. The combined meshes option, if enabled, will combine all prefabs into a far smaller number of objects. This is useful for reducing the object count and improving runtime performance and works best with less complex objects. When it is enabled, there are also options to remove animators or empty game objects, as you can see here. Enabling key prefab connection here ensures that the instantiated object in the scene will still be recognized by Unity as a prefab. When this is enabled, changing the prefab will update all instantiated objects in the scene as well. For example, if you were using a tree prefab with LED enabled, you could populate it with groups, 
then change some LED settings in the prefab and the trees in the scene would update automatically. The next setting, Override Group Defaults, allows you to up override the default pl placement settings specified to the group enabled. So you'll notice that when this is enabled, the settings from the group defaults at the top now show up here. This allows me to override these settings and change them per member. For example, if you have a group of rocks and they all behave very similarly, but one rock won't look very good on slopes of more than 30 degrees, you can overwrite the group defaults just for that one rock so that it never appears on steeper slopes while the rest of the rocks do. These settings are local and will only apply to the member being edited. Use Noise allows you to exclude objects from being placed in specific areas based on the output of a noise function. To show you all mean, I'll switch to another landscape I prepared earlier. In this landscape, I've got a number of trees spread evenly throughout the terrain. If I turn on Use Noise and then click Populate the Groups, you'll notice that trees appear in some regions like this area but not other regions like this area, and this happens randomly. The noise tile size here controls how large or small these regions are, and the placement cutoff controls what proportion of the objects gets placed, increasing the object cutoffs like this, increases the amount of objects that will be placed, decreasing the placement cutoff like this, decreases the amount of objects that will be placed. The next setting, Align with Terrain, causes the object to position itself relative to the slope it is on. If I enable it and then click Populate with Groups, you'll be able to see what I mean. As you can see, all the trees are now aligned with the slope they're on. So if you tilted to, so that the slope was flat in the camera view, the trees would appear to be pointing straight upwards. The final setting in the general tab is flatten terrain. When this is enabled, a circular area under the prefab will be flattened, which is useful for prefabs such as buildings, which need to be flat on flat ground. When it is enabled, you'll notice the align terrain option disappears, as it doesn't really make sense when flattened terrain is enabled, and three new options appear. Flattened distance here is the radius of the flattened area. Flattened blend rate controls how the flattened area blends with the surrounding terrain, and flattened offset allows you to raise or lower the flattened area relative to the surrounding terrain. So if, you populate, if I populate the groups, you'll be able to see how this flatten works. As you can see, under each tree, there is a small area which has been flattened relative to it, and it blends smoothly with the rest of the terrain. Let's move on to the settings in the XYZ tab now. I'm just going to briefly touch on these as they will also be covered in a separate video. In the XYZ tab, you can more precisely control the position and rotation of your objects. Offset Y allows you to add a vertical offset to the position of your objects, moving them up or down. So this can either be randomized, as you set it between min offset Y and max offset Y limits, or you can specify it exactly for all objects by just unticking randomize offset Y and moving the offset Y slider. Rotation Y allows you to control the top-down rotation of your objects. This is the rotation you will generally want to control. Again, you can either set it for all objects by specifying an exact value with randomize rotation Y turned off, or you can randomize it for all objects by setting start rotation Y and end rotation Y limits. Finally, Rotation Override lets you set the X and Z rotation of your object. For instance, if the prefab you have isn't rotated correctly to start with and you need to fix it. The last option we will look at in the member settings for uniform groups is the Proximity Extend, which is located in the Proximity tab for members. The Proximity Extend is an important part of the new group system and is modified by moving this slider here. With it, you can define the size of an object and ensure that objects do not appear inside of each other. The proximity extent should generally be set to a bit bigger than the radius of your object or the radius of the area you don't want other objects to appear within. Now that I've covered the basics of uniform groups, let's move on to procedural clearing groups. I've already got one set up in this small villages group. 
Unlike uniform groups, procedural clearing groups are completely different to anything that's been in Landscape Builder before. Procedural clearing groups create regions procedurally around the landscape known as clearings, where they then place the members of your group as usual in uniform groups. Manual clearing groups are similar but allow you to manually define where the clearings appear. How to do this will be covered in the group designer video. If I move around the landscape, you can see in the landscape here where the village areas which are all generated with procedural clearings. There's one here, there's another smaller one here, and if I find one, there's a large one over here as well. All of these were generated with this small villages group. Clearing groups do have a few differences that are specific to clearings, which we'll now have a look at. First and foremost among these is the group designer, which is a visual way we have developed for designing clearing groups. You can enter it by clicking the Oak Room Designer button, which is here. When you click it, you enter the group designer, which looks like this. It shows all your objects which will be placed within the clearing, as well as a few visual aids to help you determine where they should be placed and how the rules are going to affect them. This will all be covered in a separate video. It has many features which make it easy to design clearings quickly. Let's now exit it by clicking the Closed Group Designer button. Unlike uniform groups, clearing groups have general settings. The first setting, Max Groups Per Square Kilometre, controls how many clearing regions are placed around the landscape in a similar way to how Max Prefabs Per Square Kilometre works. Proximity Extent here defines the radius of the region in which other clearings cannot be placed. This is to prevent clearings from overlapping. This should generally be set larger than the minimum and maximum radius of the clearing. The minimum and maximum radius clearing settings control the range of sizes that the clearing can be. In the default settings, there is also a new option for flattening the terrain under a clearing, the flatten terrain option. The flatten blend rate and flatten height offset work in the same way that flattening works for members. The settings for members for clearing groups are for the most part the same as for uniform groups. There are a few key differences however, which we'll now look at. If I expand member 2, you can see the first difference in the general tab. The options displayed instead of max per square kilometre are max per square hectare and max per clearing. Max per square hectare works in the same way as max per square kilometre, just at a different scale for convenience. Max per clearing, on the other hand, allows you to restrict the number of objects that appear in any single clearing. For example, you might have a certain type of building that you only want to appear in any given clearing three times at most, hence you would set max per clearing to three. For instance, in this scene, there are two of these large buildings which can appear in each clearing. However, I only want them to appear once Otherwise, it would seem a bit odd having a lot of really large buildings in each clearing, in each village. The other main differences can be found in the XYZ tab. One of these is the new Place in Centre option. When this is enabled, the object will only be placed once within each clearing and will be placed in the centre, as this tower object is, which is, as you can see, in the centre of each clearing here. It can be moved relative to the centre using this offset XZ setting. The other option is rotation type, which controls how rotation is calculated for the object. There are three modes, world space, group space, and face to centre. In world space mode, rotation is calculated relative to the world coordinate system. In group space mode, rotation is calculated relative to the clearing coordinate system. Each individual clearing has a randomised rotation which defines which ob direction objects will face. In face to centre mode, the coordinate system will be defined for each object so the rotation of zero will have the object facing towards the centre of the clearing. An example of the use of face to centre mode can be used seen in this fence here, which has, as you can see, face to centre enabled. What this allows is that these fences placed around the outside of the clearing will always face inwards and hence can form a perimeter borderline. Apart from these options, members of clearing groups function the same way as members of uniform groups. 
So that brings us to the end of this video. This video was just a brief introduction to the new group system, and we'll be releasing more videos soon showcasing the other features. So watch out for those, and thank you for watching.